so um, I figured I would read a bit of plague theory, pretty much the only plague theory that I am familiar with. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot, actually, since the world has uh, gone the way it's gone. And, um, yeah, this is really the only thing that I've read that that I could call plague theory, you know, uh, uh, through and through. So I figure rather than me just reading it and writing something about it, I might as well read it on stream because um, I have a meeting. Oh, it's a little bit quiet. I'll turn it up. I have a meeting on go to go back to this. Uh, hopefully that's a little louder. I'll even turn it up a bit on my interface. Okay. So this is from a collection of Artaud's, uh, The Theater and It's Double. It doesn't actually have as much to do with the theater as you might think. Trust me, there's, there's lots of good stuff in here. The archives of the little town of Caligari in Sardinia contain the account of an astonishing historical fact. One night, at the end of April, or the beginning of May 1720, about twenty days before the arrival of Marseilles of the Grand saint Antony, a vessel whose landing coincided with the most amazing outbreak of the plague in that city's memory, St. Remy's, the viceroy of Sardinia, whose reduced monarchical, monarchical responsibilities had perhaps sensitized him to the most pernicious, pernicious of the viruses, had a particularly affecting dream. He saw himself infected by the plague. He dreamed he was ravaging the whole of his tiny city-state. Beneath such a scourge, all social forms disintegrate. Order collapses. He observes every infringement of morality, every psychological disaster. He hears his bodily fluids murmuring within him, torn, failing in a dizzying collapse of tissue. His organs grow heavy and gradually turn to carbon. But is it too late to avert the scourge? Even destroyed, even annihilated, organically pulverized and consumed to his very marrow, he knows we do not die in our dreams, that our will operates even in absurdity, even in the negation of possibility even in the transformation of the lies from which truth can be remade. He wakes up. All these rumors about the plague, these miasmas of the virus from the Orient, he will know how to keep them away now. The Grand Saint Antonin, a month out of Beirut, asks for permission to dock at Caligari. The Viceroy replies with an insane order, an order considered irresponsible, absurd, idiotic, and despotic by the public, and even by his own staff. He hastily dispatches the pilot's boat with some men to the ship, which he presumes contaminated, with the orders that the Grand Saint Antonin tack about immediately and make full sail away from town, under threat of being sunk by cannon shot. War against the plague. The autocrat was not going to waste any time. The particular strength of the influence which this dream exerted upon him should be remarked in passing, since it permitted him in spite of the sarcasms of the crowd and the skepticism of his followers, to preserve in the ferocity of his orders, trespassing because of it not only the rights of man, but upon the simplest respect for human life and upon all sorts of national or international conventions which, in the face of death, are no longer relevant. In any case, the ship continued on its course, landed at Leghorn, and entered the Marseille roadstead where it was permitted to unload its cargo. The harbor, author excuse me, the harbor authorities of Marseille have not kept a record of what happened to its plague-ridden cargo. What becomes of its crew is more or less known. Those who did not die of the plague dispersed to different countries. The Grand saint Antony did not bring the plague to Marseille. It was already there, and at a point of particular recrudescence, but its centers had been successfully localized. The plague brought by the Grand saint Antony was the Oriental Plague, the original virus, and from its approach, the diffusion in the city that had par particularly dreadful and widespread flaring of the ep epidemic dates. This inspires certain thoughts. This plague, which seems to reactivate a virus, was of itself capable of inflicting equally virulent damage. Of all the crew, the captain alone did not catch the plague. Furthermore, it does not appear that the newly arrived victims had ever been in direct contact with the others, confined as they were to close quarters. The Grand Saint Antonin, which passes within shouting range of Caligari in Sardinia, does not deposit the plague there. But the Viceroy gathers certain emanations from it in a dream, for it cannot be denied that, between the Viceroy and the plague, 
a palpable communication, however subtle, was established. And it is too easy and explains nothing to limit the communication of such a disease to contagion by simple contact. But these relations between St. Remy and the plague, strong enough to liberate themselves as images in his dream, are all the same not strong enough to infect him with the disease. In any case, the town of Caligari, learning some time later that the ship has turned from its shores by the despotic will of its viceroy, its miraculously enlightened viceroy, was at the, site, <clears throat> was at the source of the epidemic of Marseille, recorded, in, recorded the fact into its archives, where it can be found today. The plague of 1720 in Marseille has yielded us the only so-called clinical descriptions of the scourge that we possess. Yet one wonders if the plague described by, Marseille, by the Marseille doctors was indeed the same as that of 1347 in Florence, which produced the Decameron. History, sacred books, among them the Bible, certain old medical treatises, describe externally all sorts of plagues concerning which they seem to have paid much less attention to morbid symptoms than to the demoralizing and prodigious effects that they produced on the victims' minds. They were probably right in doing so. For medicine would have considerable trouble establishing a basic difference between the virus of which Pericles died before Sericles. Supposing the word virus to be something other than a mere... It's still a bit quiet, eh? Okay, I should have it up a little bit. Tell, tell me if it's any better, at least. If not, I'll always boost the volume when I post it on the channel. According to these same treaties... Did I skip something? No, okay. The only authentic plague is the plague from Egypt, which rises from the cemeteries uncovered when the Nile recedes. The Bible and Herodotus both call attention to the lightning-like appearance of the plague, which in one night decimated eight, excuse me, 180,000 men of the Assyrian army, thereby saving the Egyptian empire. If this fact is true, we should have to consider the scourge as the direct instrument or materialization of an intelligent force in close contact with what we call fatality. And this, with or without the army of rats, which that same night threw itself on the Assyrian troops, whose leather armor and harnesses they gnawed to pieces in a few hours. The fact is comparable to the epidemic which broke out in 1660 in the holy city of Makako, Japan, on the occasion of a mere change of government. The plague of 1502 in province, which furnished Nostradamus his opportunities to exercise his powers as a healer, coincided with the most profound political upheavals, downfalls or deaths of kings, disappearance and destruction of provinces, earthquakes, magnetic phenomena of all kinds, exoduses of Jews, which proceed or follow in the political or cosmic order, cataclysms and devastations whose effects those who provoke them are too stupid to, <laughs> too stupid to foresee and not perverse enough to actually desire. Whatever may be the error of historians or physicians concerning the plague, I believe we can agree on the idea of a malady that would be a kind of psychic entity and would not be carried by a virus. If one wished to analyze closely all the facts of plague, plague contagion that history or even memoirs provide us with, it would be difficult to isolate one actually verified instance of contagion by contact. And Boccaccio's example of swine that died from having sniffed the sheets of which plague victims had been wrapped, scarcely suggests more than a kind of mysterious affinity between pig and the nature of the plague, which again would have to be very closely analyzed. Although there exists no concept of an actual morbid entity, there are some forms upon which the mind can provisionally agree as characterizing certain phenomena, and it seems the mind can agree to a plague described in the following manner. Before the onset of any very marked physical or psychological discomfort, the body is covered with red spots, which the victim notices suddenly only when they turn blackish. The victim scarcely hesitates to become alarmed before his head begins to boil and to grow overpoweringly heavy, and he collapses. Then he is seized by a terrible fatigue, the fatigue of a centralized magnetic suction, of his molecules divided and drawn towards their annihilation. His crazed body 
His crazed body fluids, settled and commingled, seem to be flooding through his flesh. His gorge rises. The inside of his stomach seems as if it were trying to gush out between his teeth. His pulse, which at times slows slows down to a shadow of itself, a mere virtuality of a pulse, and others at others races at the boiling of a fever within, constant with the streaming aberration of his mind, beating in hurried strokes, like his heart, which grows intense, heavy, loud. His eyes, first inflamed, then glazed, his swollen, gasping tongue. First white, then red, then black, as if charred and split, Everything proclaims an unprecedented organic upheaval. Soon the body fluids, furrowed like the earth struck by lightning, like lava kneaded by subterranean forces, search for an outlet. The fieriest point is formed at the center of each spot. Around these points the skin rises in blisters like air bubbles under the surface of lava, and these blisters are surrounded by circles, of which the outermost, like Saturn's ring around the incandescent planet, indicates the extreme limit of a bubo. The body is furrowed with them, but just as volcanoes have their elected spots on the earth, so bubos make their preferred appearance on the surface of the human body, around the anus, in the armpits, in the precious places where the active glands faithfully perform their functions, the bubos appear. Wherever the organism discharges either its internal rottenness or, according to its case, its life, in most cases, a violent burning sensation, localized in one spot, indicates the organism's life has lost nothing of its force, and that a remission of the disease or even its cure is possible. Like a silent rage, the most terrible plague is the one that does not reveal its symptoms. The course of a plague victim shows no lesions which op <clears throat> the corpse of a plague victim shows no lesions when opened. The gallbladder which must filter heavy and inert wastes of the organism, is full, swollen to bursting with black, viscous and fluid so dense as to suggest a new form of matter altogether. The blood in the arteries and the veins are so black and viscous. The flesh is hard as stone. On the inner surfaces of the stomach membrane, innumerable spurts of blood seem to have appeared. Everything indicates a fundamental disorder of the secretions, but there is no Excuse me. There is neither a loss nor a destruction of matter, as in leprosy or syphilis. The intestines themselves, which are in the site of the bloodiest disorders of all, and in which substances attain an unheard of degree of putrefaction and petrification, are not originally affected. The gallbladder, from which the hardened pus must be virtually torn, as the, in certain human sacrifices with a sharp knife, a hard, vitreous instrument of obsidian, the gallbladder is hyperatrophied and cracking in places, but intact, without any parts missing, without visible lesion, without loss of substance. In certain cases, however, the injured lungs blacken, excuse me, the injured lungs and brains blacken and grow gangra, gangrenous. The softened and pitted lungs, pitted lungs fall into the chips of some unknown black substance. The brain melts, shrinks, granulates to a sort of coal black dust. Two, ob two important observations can be made about this fact. The first is that the plague syndrome is complete without the gangrene of the lungs and brain, the victim dying without the putrefaction of any member at all. Without underestimating the nature of the disease, we can say that the organism does not require the presence of a localized physical gangrene to determine its own death. The second observation is that the, two, the only two organs really affected and injured by the plague the brains and the lungs, are both directly dependent upon consciousness and the will. We can keep ourselves from breathing or from thinking. We, can't, we can keep ourselves from breathing or from thinking. We can speed up our respiration, give it any rhythm we choose, make it conscious or unconscious at will, in, induce, introduce a balance between two kinds of breathing, the automatic, which is under direct control of the sympathetic nervic system, and the other, which is subject to those reflexes of the brain, which have once again become conscious. We can similarly accelerate, retard, and give arbitrary rhythm to our thinking, can regulate the con unconscious play of the mind. We cannot control the filtering of bodily fluids by the liver or the redistribution of blood by the heart and the arteries, cannot restrain digestion, arrest or accelerate elimination of matter from the intestine. 
Thus the plague seems to manifest its presence in and have a preference for the very organs of the body, the particular physical sites where human will, consciousness, and thought are imminent and apt to occur. In 1880 or so, a French doctor by the name of Yersin, working on some cadavers of Indo-Chinese natives who had died of the plague, insulated one of those round-headed, short-tailed tadpoles which only the microscope can reveal and called it the plague microbe. Personally, I regard this microbe only as a smaller, indefinite, sorry, infinitely smaller material element which appears at some moment in the development of the virus, but which in no way accounts for the plague. And I should like this doctor to tell me why all great plagues, with or without virus, have a duration of five months, after which their virulence abates, and how the Turkish ambassador who was passing through Languedoc through towards the end of 19, excuse me, 1720, <clears throat> 1720, was able to draw an imaginary line from Nice through Avignon and Toulouse and Bordeaux, marking the limit of the scourge's geographical extent, a line which events proved to be accurate. From all this emerges the spiritual physiognomy of a disease whose, li whose laws cannot be precisely defined and whose geographical origin it would be idiotic to attempt to determine. For the Egyptian plague is not the Oriental plague, which is not that described by Hippocrates, which is not that of Syracuse, nor of Florence, nor of the Black Death, which accounted for 50 million lives in medieval Europe. No one can say why the plague strikes a coward who flees it and spares the degenerate who gratifies himself on the corpses. Why distance, chastity, solitude are helpless against attacks of the scourge. Why a group of debauchees isolating themselves in the country, like Boccaccio with his two well-stocked companions and seven women as lustful as they were religious, can calmly wait for the warm days when the plague withdraws. And why in a nearby castle, transformed into a citadel with a cordon of armed men to forbid all entry, the plague turns the garrison and all occupants into corpses and spares only the armed men exposed to the contagion. Who can also explain why the military cordon sanitaire, which Mehmet Ali established towards the end of the last century, on the occasion of an outbreak of the Egyptian plague, effectively protected covenants, schools, prisons, and palaces? Why numerous epidemics of a plague with all characteristic symptoms of oriental plague could suddenly break up break out in medieval Europe, in places having no contact whatever with the Orient. From these particularities, these mysteries, these contradictions, and these symptoms, we must construct the spiritual physiognomy of a disease whose progressively, which progressively destroys the organism like a pain which, as it intensifies and deepens, multiplies its resource and means of access at every level of sensibility. But from the spiritual freedom with which the plague develops, without rats, without microbes, and without contact, can be deduced the somber and absolute action of a spectacle which I shall attempt to analyze. Once the plague is established in a city, the regular forms collapse. There is no maintenance of roads, of sewers, no army, no police, no municipal administration. Pyres are lit at random to burn the dead, and whatever means are, with whatever means are available. Each family wants to have his own, then, wood, space, and flame itself growing rare, there are family feuds around the pyre, soon followed by a general flight, for the corpses are too numerous, the dead already clog the streets in ragged pyramids gnawed at by animals around the edges, the stench rises in the air like a flame, entire streets are blocked by piles of the dead, then, the houses open and the delirious victims, their minds crowded with hideous visions, spread howling through the streets. The disease their f that ferments in their viscera and circulates throughout their entire organism discharges itself in tremendous cerebral explosions. Other victims, without buboes, delirium, pain, or rash, examine themselves proudly in the mirror, in splendid health, and they think, and then fall dead with their shaving mugs in their hands, full of scorn for other victims. Over the poisonous, thick, bloodied streams, color of agony and opium, which gushes out of the corpses. Strange personages pass, 
dressed in wax with noses long as sausages and eyes of glass, mounted on a kind of Japanese sandal made of double wooden tablets, one horizontal in the form of a soul, the other vertical to keep them from the contaminated fluids, chanting absurd litanies that cannot prevent them from sinking into the furnace in their turn. These ignorant doctors betray only their fear and their childishness. The dregs of the population, apparently immunized by their frenzied greed, enter the open houses and pillage riches they know will serve no purpose or benefit. At that moment, the theater is born. The theater, i.e., an immediate gratuitous provoking, i.e., an immediate gratuitousness provoking acts without use or profit. The last of the living are in a frenzy. The obedient and virtuous son kills his father. The chaste man performs sodomy upon his neighbors. The lecher becomes pure. The miser throws his gold in handfuls out the window. The warrior hero sets, the f sets fire to the city he once risked his life to save. The dandy decks himself out in finest clothes and promenades before the charnel houses. Neither the idea of an absence of sanctions nor an that of an imminent death suffices to motivate acts so gratuitously absurd on the part of men who did not believe death could end anything. And... How explain the surge of erotic fever among the recovered victims who, instead of fleeing the city, remain where they are, trying to wretch a criminal pleasure from the dying or even the dead, half crushed under piles of corpses where chance has lodged them. But if a mighty scourge is required to make this frantic, frantic gratuitousness show itself, and if this scourge is the so-called plague, then perhaps we can determine the value of this gratuitousness in relation to our total personality. The state of the victim who dies without material destruction, with all the stigmata of an absolute and almost abstract disease upon him, is identical with the state of an actor entirely penetrated by feelings that do not benefit or even relate his real condition. Everything in the physical aspect of the actor, as in the victim of the plague, shows that life has reacted to the paroxysm, yet nothing has happened. Between the victims of the plague who run in shrieking pursuit of his visions, and the actor in pursuit of his feelings. Between the man who invents himself personages he could have never imagined without the plague, creating them in the midst of an audience of corpses and delirious lunatics, and the poet who inopportunely invents characters, entrusting, to them, entrusting them to a public equally inert or delirious, there are other analogies which confirm the only truths that count and locate the actions of the theater like that of the plague, of the, on the level of veritable epidemic. <coughs> but, whereas the images of the plague, occurring in relation to a powerful state of physical disorganization, are like the last volleys of a spiritual force that is exhausting itself, the images of poetry in the theater are a spiritual force that begins its trajectory upon the senses, and does without reality altogether. Once launched upon the fury of his task, an actor requires infinitely more power to keep from committing a crime than a murderer needs courage to complete his act. And it is here, in the very gratuitousness, that the action and effect of a feeling in the theater appears infinitely more valid than it did, than that of feeling fulfilled in life. Compared with the murderer's fury which exhausts itself, that of the tragic actor remains enclosed within a perfect circle. The murderer's fury has accomplished an act, discharges itself, and loses contact with the force that inspired it, but can no longer sustain it. That of the actors has taken a form that negates itself just to the degree it frees itself and dissolves into universality. Extending the spiritual image of the plague, we can compound the troubled body fluids of the victim as the material aspect of a disorder which, in other contexts, is equivalent to the conflicts struggles and cataclysms and debacles our lives afford us it is just and just as it is not impossible that the unavailing despair of the lunatic screaming in an asylum can cause the plague by a sort of reversibility of feeling and images one can similarly admit that the external events political conflicts natural cataclysms the order of revolution and the disorder of war by occurring in the context of the theater, discharge themselves into the sensibility of an audience with all the force of an epidemic. In the City of God, St. Augustine complains 
of the similarity between the action of the plague that kills without destroying the organs and the theater which, without killing, provokes the most mysterious alterations in the mind not only of an individual, but of an entire populace. No, he says, you are, who are ignorant that these plays, sinful spectacles, were not established in Rome by the vices of men, but by the order of your gods. It would be more reasonable to render divine honors unto Scipio than to such gods. Surely they are not worthy of their pontiff. In order to appease the plague that killed your bodies, your gods have commanded in their honor these plays, and your pontiff, wishing to avoid this plague that corrupts their that corrupts souls, opposes the construction of the stage itself. If there still remains among you a sufficient trace of intelligence to prefer to the soul to the body, choose what deserves your revenance. For the strategy of the evil spirits, foreseeing that the contagion would end with your body, seize joyfully upon the occasion to introduce a much more dangerous scourge among you, one that attacks not only bodies but customs. In fact, such is the blindness, such is the corruption produced in the soul that by plays that, even in these late times, those whom this feudal passion possessed, who had escaped from the sack of Rome and taken refuge in Carthage, passed each day at the theater priding themselves on their delirious enthusiasm for the actors. It is useless to give precise reasons for this contagious delirium. It would be like trying to find reasons why our nervous system, after a certain period, responds to the vibrations of subtlest music and is eventually somehow modified by them in a lasting way. First of all, we must recognize that the theater, like the plague, is a delirium and is communicative. The mind believes what it sees and does not and does what it believes. That is the secret of the fascination. Nor does St. Augustine's tact <clears throat> nor does St. Augustine's text question for one moment the reality of this fascination. However, there are conditions to be rediscovered in order to re engender the in the mind a spectacle capable of fascinating it, and this is not a simple matter of art. For if the theatre is like the plague, it is not only because it affects important collectivities and upsets them in an identical way. In the theatre, as in the plague, there is something both victorious and vengeful. We are aware that the spontaneous conflagrant conflagration which the plague lights wherever it passes is nothing else other than an immense liquidation. A social disaster so far reaching, an organic disorder so mysterious, this overflow of vices, this total exorcism which presses and impels the soul to its most utmost, all indicate the presence of a state which is nonetheless characterized by extreme strength and in which all the powers of nature are freshly discovered at the moment when something essential is going to be accomplished. The plague takes images that are dormant, a latent, a, <coughs> excuse me, a latent disorder, and suddenly extends them into the most extreme gestures. The theater also takes gestures and pushes them as far as they will go. Like the plague, it reforms the chain between what is and what is not, between the virtuality of the possible and what already exists in materialized nature. It recovers the notion of symbols and the archetypes which act, like silent blows, rests, leaps of the heart, suck, summons of the nymph, excuse me, summons of the limp, inflammatory images thrust into our abruptly weakened heads. The theater restores us our dominant conflicts and all their powers, and gives these powers the name we hail as symbols. And behold, before our eyes is fought a, a battle of symbols, one charging against another in an impossible melee. For there can be theater only from the moment when, there, when the impossible really begins, and when poetry which occurs on stage sustains and superheats the realized symbols. These symbols, the sign of their right powers previously held in servitude and unavailable to reality, burst forth in the guise of incredible images which give freedom to the city, freedom of the city and the existence to acts which are by nature hostile to the life of societies. In a true theater, a play disturbs the senses repose disturbs the senses repose frees the repressed unconscious and cites a kind of virtual revolt which the repressed unconscious excuse me which moreover can have more can have its full effect only if it remains virtual let me drink some water here sorry
and imposes on the assembled collectivity an attitude that is both difficult and heroic. Thus in Ford's, "'Tis a pity she's a whore." From the moment the curtain rises, we see our utter stupefaction, a, we see <laughs> to our utter stupefaction, a creature flung to insol insolent vindication of incest, exerting all the vigor of his youthful con consciousness to proclaim and justify it. He does not waver an instant, he does not hesitate a minute, and thereby shows of how little account are all the barriers that could be opposed to him. He is heroically criminal and audaciously, ostentatiously heroic. Everything derives, everything drives him in this direction, and inflames his enthusiasm. He recognizes neither earth nor heaven, only the force of this convulsive passion, to which this rebellious and equally heroic passion of Annabella does not fail to respond. I weep, he says, but not with remorse, not with remorse, but for fear, so f for fear I shall not be able to satisfy my passion. They are both forgers, hypocrites, and liars for the sake of their superhuman passion which laws obstruct and condemn, but which they will put beyond the law. Vengeance for vengeance, and crime for crime. When we believe them threatened, hunted down, lost, when we are ready to pity them as victims, then they reveal themselves ready to render destiny threat for threat and blow for blow. With them we proceed from excess to excess and vindication to vindication. Annabella is captured, convicted of, convicted of adultery and incest, trampled upon, insulted, dragged by the hair, and we are astonished to discover that, far from seeking a means of escape, she provokes her executioner still further and sings out a kind of obstinate heroism. heroism. It is in the condition of revolt. It is in the exemplary case of love without respite which makes us, the spectators, gasp with anguish at the idea nothing will ever be able to stop it. If we desire an example of freedom in revolt, Ford's Annabella provides this poetic example bound up with the image of absolute danger. When we tell ourselves we have reached the paroxysm of blood, horror, blood, and flouted laws, of poetry which consecrates revolt, we are obliged to advance still further into an endless vertigo. But ultimately, we tell ourselves, there is vengeance. There is death for such an audacity and such an irresistible crime. But there is no such thing. Giovanni, the lover, inspired by the passion of great poets, puts himself beyond vengeance, beyond crime, by still another crime, one that is indescribably passionate, beyond threats, beyond horror, by an even greater horror, one which overthrows, and at one at the same time, law, morality, and all those who dare themselves, to dare set themselves up as administrators of justice. A trap is cleverly set. A great banquet is given where, among the guests, hired ruffians and spies are to be hidden, ready at the first signal to throw themselves upon him. But this hero, cornered and lost, and inspired by love, will let no will let no one pass sentence on his love. You want, he seems to say, my love's flesh and blood. Very well. I will throw this love in your face and shower you with its blood, for you are incapable of rising to its height. And he kills his beloved tears out of her heart as if to feast upon it, and in the middle of a banquet where he himself is one of the guests he hoped to devour. One whom the guests had hoped to devour. And before being executed, he manages to kill his rival, his sister's husband, who has dared to come between him and his love, and dispatches him in a final combat, which then appears as his own spasm of agony. Like, a, like the plague, the theater is, formidable, is a formidable call to the forces that impel the mind, by example, to the sources of its conflicts. And it is evident that Ford's passional example merely symbolizes a still greater and absolutely essential task. The terrorizing ap apparition of evil, which the mysteries of Eleusius was produced in this pure, truly, which in the mysteries of Eleusius was produced in its pure, truly revealed form, corresponds to the dark hour of certain ancient tragedies, which all true theater must recover. If essential theater is like the plague, it is not because it is contagious but because, like the plague, it is the revelation, the bringing forth, 
the exteriorization of a depth of latent cruelty by which means of which all perverse possibilities of the mind, whether of an individual or a people, are localized. Like the, th like the plague, the theater is a time of evil, a triumph of dark powers that are nourished by a power even more profound until extinction. In the theater, as in the plague, there is a kind of strange sun, a light of abnormal intensity which seems, which, by which it seems that the difficult and even impossible suddenly become our normal element. And Ford's play, like the true theater, is within the radiance of this strange sun. His Annabella res resembles the plague's freedom by means of which, from degree to degree, stage to stage, the victim swells his individuality and the survivor gradually becomes grandiose and overwhelming being. We can now see that all true freedom is dark, and infallibly identified with a sexual freedom which is also dark, although we do not know precisely why. For it has been a long time since the Platonic Eros, the projective, protect, protective sense, pro, excuse me, the procreative sense, the freedom of life vanished beneath the somber veneer of the libido, which is identified with all that is dirty, abject, infamous in the process of living and throwing oneself headlong with a natural and impure vigor, with a perpetually renewed strength upon life. And that is why all great myths are dark, so that one cannot imagine, save an atmosphere of carnage, torture, and bloodshed, all the magnificent fables which recount to the multitudes the first sexual division and the first carnage of essences that appeared in creation. The theater, like the plague, is in this image of the carnage and this essential separation. It releases conflicts, disengages powers, liberates possibilities, and, if these possibilities and these powers are dark, it is not <clears throat> excuse me, it is the fault not of the plague nor of the theater, but of life. We do not see that life as it is and as it has been fashioned for us provides many reasons for exaltation. It appears that by means of the plague, a giant abscess, as much moral as it is social, has been collectively drained, and like the plague, the theater has been creative to drain abscesses collectively. Perhaps the theater's poison, injected into the social body, disintegrates it, as St. Augustine says, but at least it does so as the plague as an avenging scourge, a redeeming ep epidemic in which credulous ages have been chosen to see the finger of God, and which is nothing but the application of a law of nature, whereby every gesture is counterbalanced by a gesture and every action by a reaction. The theater, like the plague, is a crisis which is resolved by death or cure. And the plague is a superior disease because it is a total crisis, after which nothing remains except death or an extreme purification. Similarly, the theater is a disease because it is the supreme equilibrium which cannot be achieved without destruction. It invites the mind to share a delirium, <clears throat> which exalts its energies. And we can see, to conclude from that human point of view, the, the action of the theater, like that of the plague, for, impelling men to see themselves as they are, it causes the mask to fall, reveals the lie, the slackness, baseness, and hypocrisy of our world. It shakes off the asphyxi asphyxiating inertia of matter which invades even the clearest testimony of the senses, and, in revealing it to the collectives, collectivities of men, their dark power, their hidden force, it invites them to take, in the face of destiny, a superior and heroic attitude they would have never assumed without it. And the question we must now ask is whether, in this slippery world which is committing suicide without even noticing it, there can be found a nucleus of men capable of imposing this superior notion of the theater, men who will restore all of us to the natural and magic equivalent to, of the dogmas in which we no longer believe. So, um, I think there's actually a lot to this, um, to, to kind of draw connections to where we are today. Like, I think the idea of him trying to separate sort of the psychological aspects of, of a plague 
from the virus, right? That there, there may be this contagion that goes around and, and spreads, but the intellectual element of the virus, right? The panic, the fear, all that sort of stuff, that spread long before the virus did, right? Or much quicker, should I say, than the virus did. And now, at this point, it seems like the virus, although it is causing great amounts of damage in, in countries like Italy and stuff, I mean, there are countries like Canada, right, where the death toll is still very, very low, but the panic, <laughs> the psychological plague is here, right? Everybody is in this sort of state of, of panic, or at least a lot of people that I talk to are, I don't know, still some people are going out to the beaches in Vancouver, apparently. Um, what was another really interesting part I wanted to bring up? What did you guys think about it? Did you guys think it was, uh, had anything useful to say about what's going on right now? I think there's a bit of a delay on the chat here. I liked his, um, his description at the start of just like what the plague actually is. I thought that was just a beautiful little passage. Beautiful, beautifully disgusting passage. This this uh, idea of like the reversal too of of uh, personalities, you know how it seems to be pushing people to these these sorts of or it, perhaps it hasn't yet, but that um, when people get pushed far enough on these sorts of of um, manic, <laughs> you know the, the the psychological disease that you you kind of you can't help but break down. You can't help but try to escape whatever you have been, whatever you are, whatever you're in, and try to try to jump into something new, if it's more stable or whatever. Like, if the old is, is dying away, what else can you do but try to try to change? And the idea of the theater, too, as being... Um, the theater and the plague is something which, which sort of drains social abscesses. Um... I kind of see this in the way, honestly, that we're reacting against liberalism in a weird way. That all these sorts of things that liberalism has established that maybe need to be drained away, like the way uh, the rent system has been set up, or the way uh, the medical system has been developed so as to seemingly, you know, be completely unprepared for things like pandemics. Like, these are are abscesses, which I don't think they could be trained without some sort of dramatic shift like this, right? <laughs> yeah, sorry for everybody who came in late. I was just bored, so I decided to read something on stream. I didn't really plan this. Um, I think, I think ultimately, according to, to our Toad's definition, we are in a plague for sure, in the sense that we are seeing these, these, uh, this intellectual contagion sweep over the world and sort of turn us into something we weren't before, right? And he's quite optimistic about it in that either sort of like it ends in death or purification. Um, so maybe that's a, uh, yeah, abscess is a really great term for it. Eh? I really like that. Um, but maybe this is a this is the purification we need, you know, maybe this is uh, going to be, it's going to c cause a lot of death, but maybe out of the death there could be some sort of uh, renewed, renewed understanding of what, what the human is or what society is or, or our relation, you know, r the relationship between those things. I think I don't have all that much to say about it right now. In the sense that I, I do, but I'm, I'm still kind of working it all out of my brain. So what I basically just wanted to do is get on stream and read it for everybody. Um, um, everybody should should be trying to jump into these things. If you guys have any other good plague theory or stories or anything to read too, let me know. Um, I'd be very, very happy to to do something else like this soon because I'm, I'm bored. I'm sure everybody else is bored. Um, it also, if you guys are uh, continuing to be bored, I just recently released a collection of basically just all my old writings and stuff like that. I put it up on my Twitter. It's pinned to my Twitter page if you guys feel like checking it out. Um, yeah, thanks very much for joining me for this, this little reading. 
And if you guys come up with any any more ideas for things I can read on stream, um, <laughs> I've got a lot of free time now. So, yeah. Peppy's Diary from 1665. All right, I'm going to look that up and I'll give it a read. Thanks, everybody. See you in the next one.